Now, in a few short weeks, the world will celebrate the second anniversary of the Abraham Accords. But what will happen to the peace in the region if the Iran nuclear deal is renewed? To find out, ILTV and Israeli Channel 14 partnered for a special discussion with U.S. envoy to the Middle East, Jason Greenblatt. And joining us now with the details is reporter Asaf Nissan. Hello, Asaf. Good afternoon, Ital. So, Asaf, you sat down with uh, Mr. Greenblatt for this special interview. What was uh, some of the main points you discussed? So some of the main points we discussed throughout the interview, of course, starting with the Iran deal, were, of course, the reasons the Biden administration is running back, what's going to be gained from it by the Europeans, anything all throughout the Iran deal, according, and of course, the effect on the Abraham Accords. How would the Abraham Accords deal with the fact that Iran might be heading to a new deal with the U.S.? Is it still relevant? Is the U.S. still a partner here? And throughout the other topics, of course, the Palestinians, the Trump affairs, and we can even talk, we even try to talk about some of the personal stuff, but, you know, it's part of what he knows is a former advisor can pretty much advise on what's going on behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's uh, have a look. Then why is the Biden administration so hellbent on getting Iran back to the nuclear deal? It's very hard to explain. I think they're looking for a political win. I think if they were to sign it, they would be able to say, well, we've kept America safe. But the, the subtitle should be, we've kept America potentially safe if Iran really doesn't cheat for a very short period of time. And then the Middle East would become even messier, even more dangerous. It's Afghanistan all over again, but on steroids. One of the conditions Iran stated for rejoining the JCPOA is their assets will be unfrozen. Is this really a good call? No, it's a terrible move. Look what they did with it when we gave them all that money on, under the Obama administration. Missiles were flying toward Israel, towards the UAE, towards Saudi Arabia. You know, missiles hit uh, an important oil production facility in Saudi Arabia. Imagine what happens now with oil prices. Yes, they're creeping downward a little bit, though we have serious oil pricing issues. Imagine what that does to the world when they start to use that money again to make terrorism even worse than it is today, and it's pretty bad today. So if the U.S. is ready to go back to the deal, thus weakening the Abraham Accords? It could be, and that's what I covered a lot in my book. Um, the region is very nervous. They were nervous when we came into uh, the region under the Trump administration because they felt that the Obama administration had totally abandoned them. They're feeling that way now, and at the, at the same time, you're seeing moves to restore diplomatic relations between Iran and some of the Gulf countries. And I don't blame them. I think if they don't know where the wind is blowing and they feel like they're going to be stuck with the Iran deal, which is very, very possible, I think that they need to do something to, uh, in some way, partner with Iran. And that could undermine the Abraham Accords. I hope that the friendship and the business ties and everything else that has developed between the countries and Israel will withstand this change. But if the Biden administration continues down this path, and if it doesn't pick up um, more than what it did on its trip and respect our friends and allies, in particular Saudi Arabia, a lot of things could change and go in a bad direction. Another issue you worked on closely was the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and even presented the plan of the century for peace between both sides. Why do you think the current administration didn't try to adjust it to their own needs? Was there anyone to talk to? We're not the first that the Palestinians have spurned. In fact, we were, the, uh, you know, one of many in a long line of possible deals for the Palestinians. I think the difference in our proposal is ours was extraordinarily detailed. It wasn't just sort of, you know, a couple of words on each issue and then hope and pray that the parties would be able to work together. Um, I do give the Biden administration credit that they're not pushing an Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. They've all but said, perhaps even said directly, that the time is not right, and I think that's true. But they are making all sorts of moves that make me very uncomfortable. One. President Biden did on his visit to Israel, where he visited the East Jerusalem hospital without an Israeli presence. He made it sound like the reason he did that was not for politics, but because he's very interested in healthcare. But we all know everything is about politics. I think that disrespected Israel's capital. I think it disrespected U.S. law. I don't want to say it violated U.S. law, but it's very strange for a president of the United States to go into another country and visit somewhere in its capital without the presence of that country's leadership. All right, now what else did you discuss? Throughout the conversation, we also discussed uh, how does he see the two years of the Abraham Accords. 
actually also talking about how the Biden administration is warning the Middle East and actually hurting the entire efforts the Trump administration did. And also actually referring to the whole story of Shalina Bwakle and why the, why the Biden administration is doing a lot of mistakes. Despite the fact that they're not pushing forward, they're still asking Israel to work on an inquiry. They're working together with the Palestinians for their own offices. There's a whole issue of policy and questions of what's going on now with the Biden administration so hell-bent to destroy and what will happen if a normal leader comes in. Interesting. Asafe Nissan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much.